A few years ago, my mom gave me this. This is a photo album of my childhood growing up. And humans, since really time began, have, have had this fascination with history, with capturing history. And, and modern times is taking uh, pictures, but back, back, back in the day, it was really journaling memories, writing them down. And in these memories that we have, one of the things that gets captured so often are those embarrassing moments that somebody in the family brings up every holiday. They, they, they say, do you remember when you said, do you remember when you did? You go, yes, thanks for bringing it up again, right? I thought we got over this last holiday. And this bad boy right here, it has a lot of those memories, a lot of those photos. And so I want to share a few of them, but I want to share a few of them sparingly, knowing that a photo album, it tells a lot about us and it captures a lot about us. It can capture us when we are at our best, doing our best. They capture our guilt and our shame. They can capture our inner warrior. They can capture us in style. They can capture our secret lives. And they can either, even capture you before you go capture Gotham City villains. You know, there is a reason why we um, capture pictures. We take pictures. We capture the memories through journaling. It's because as humans, we are prone to forget. We're prone to forget things. And it's really, it's kind of an art form, right? We're really talented at forgetting things. And in youth ministry, uh, Stephanie and I, uh, we, we got this, this honorable privilege that whenever there would be a new incoming freshman class that would come into the youth group, the seniors would inevitably complain. And they would say, oh, the freshmen. And then they would have this list of what the freshmen did. You know, the freshmen, this, freshmen, that. And we had the opportunity and the privilege to sit down with them and say, you know, you were just as obnoxious, if not worse, when you were a freshman. We forget all too easily. We forget all too easily. Now, what if, what if we had a photo album capturing our spiritual lives? What if we had a photo album for our spiritual journey? I mean, how cool would it be to remember, to look back and have a snapshot of those moments in your life where God worked powerfully in your life? You know those moments you felt so beaten down and so discouraged, so depressed, and you had a friend who showed up at the right time with the right words. Or the time you felt so low that somebody came for you and they prayed with you. In that moment, you, you realize, man, God is here, that God notices. Or the time where you took a big step in faith and you felt so uncomfortable and yet God honored it so profoundly. How cool would it be to have those snapshots that we can look back on, we can turn the page and we go, oh, I remember then. How moving and how powerful it would be to reflect on those. And for some of you, the thought of having a spiritual photo album would haunt you because the, you, it would be filled with blank pages and you would be embarrassed if anybody knew that. But one thing every spiritual photo album would have is our point of origin, our beginning. Pictures of who we were. And it wouldn't be the embarrassing pictures that we laugh at, but it would be those pictures that we tried to burn. We tried to, to get rid of fast. It would be pictures of our uncontrollable anger and rage. Pictures of uh, fights and breakups, of cheating and stealing, of abuse and neglect, of porn and affairs, of greed and fraud, of backbiting and lying, of alcohol and drugs, the, the pictures that we wanted to burn and to get rid of forever. 
whether we see our spiritual life as a priority, we all are spiritual. We all have a spiritual life. That's true. And in fact, most people don't have an issue with saying they're spiritual. Most people don't have an issue with that. In fact, it's kind of trending today to say, I'm a spiritual person. A lot of people will say, you know what, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious. I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious. Meaning, I believe there is something out there beyond me, but I'm just not, con- I'm just not gonna ascribe to some organized religious belief system. I'm just not going to commit myself to a church. I'm spiritual, but I am just not into this organized religion. So what about spirituality? What about spirituality? If we are all spiritual, is that enough? Is that enough? Well, the truth about spirituality might shock you. Paul opens up Ephesians chapter 2 by describing our spiritual photo album of who we were. And he does talk about a spiritual life. And the purpose is this. The purpose is we learn who we are by who we were. We learn who we are by who we were. And that's, where, that's why he brings us up. And here's what he says about a spiritual photo album in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Everyone is spiritual, but the truth is, it's not what you expected to hear. He says, yes, you are all spiritual, but that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Why? Because, we, the, because the truth is, we all need spiritual renovation. We all need spiritual renovation, no matter how spiritual of a person you are. That we were all at a point in our life, whether we we grew up in the church or we didn't grow up going to church at all, where we needed change. We needed transformation inside of us desperately. Not just physically, but spiritually. We needed change. We needed renovation. And Paul uses the word dead to describe who we were apart from Christ. Outside of Christ, this is who we were. We were spiritually dead. The spiritual state of humanity is death and alienation. Death and alienation. That we were in complete and total need of overhaul, of renovation, of something desperately to change inside of us. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, Paul gives us a very insightful understanding of the spiritual backdrop of our lives, of our world. And what he says here, uh, later, uh, later Christians would call this uh, the three, uh, three enemies of the soul or the unholy trinity. It is this triad of evil that wages war against God. This triad of evil that wages war inside of us and all around us. And the three enemies of the soul are society, Satan, and self. Society, Satan, and self. Now these things wage war in our relationship with God, in our society, in the world in which we live. And we see this not just here in our passage, but we see it all over the place. And some of the two most prominent places we see this is uh, Jesus' own temptation and his story of the parable of the sower. And Jesus' temptation, he goes to a desert and he fasts from eating food for 40 days. And then after 40 days, Satan comes to try to tempt Jesus rather unsuccessfully. But the first thing he does is he comes to Jesus, he tempts him with himself. He says, if you turn, the, just turn this rock into bread. He starts with himself, with Jesus' own self, with his flesh. 
And the next thing he does, he, he takes Jesus to the temple and, and puts him uh, at the, the highest point of the temple and says, Jesus, throw yourself off. Scripture says that God would send his angels to rescue you. That right before everybody, as they're in the temple, they would see this divine act where God sent his angels and they would immediately recognize he is the Messiah. He is the one. And so he tempts him with society. And then the last one, Satan comes to him and says, if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms. Self, society, Satan. And then you have the parable of the sower, right? Jesus gives this story about this farmer who comes out and he begins just to throw seed all over the ground and it lands on four, the seed lands on four different kinds of soil. And the seed represents the truth of the gospel. The soil represents our heart and being receptive to that message. And Jesus says there is three bad soils and one good soil. And each of the bad soils represents self, society, and Satan. And with that in mind, look at what he says. Verse 2. Following the course of this world. He begins by describing society, saying that, that we have followed the course of this world. The imagery is that of pattering, of modeling our life off of how the world lives, of the values in the world. And this doesn't mean that as Christians we ought to hate the world or reject the world, but that the value, value systems in the world is corrupt and it does not honor God or reflect God. John says this in his uh, letter, 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why is that the case? Why is that the case? Well, Paul continues in verse 2. He says, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The prince of the air is the imagery of Satan. He, he says that the, the force, uh, in, uh, force of influence and power in the world's values and spirituality is Satan. Why is the world so corrupt? Why do we see so many things going wrong? In society, in politics, in life, why do we see things so out of hand? The biblical authors say it is because Satan is the one who is influencing it. And so when the world, so when we follow the patterns of the world, we are following the lead of Satan. And I know what you're thinking. The phrase, the devil made me do it, carries a little bit more weight. Not so fast, right? Look at verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and, we, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He says the only reason the world or Satan has any influence in us is because we have welcomed it through our desires, through our own desires, through our own wants. And the, the word flesh was this way of describing our natural impulses, our natural cravings that really has this tendency to get out of hand. Now James captures this best when he says this in James 1. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Now think about this on the ground level for a second. It is through society that influences our worldview. It influences how we understand family dynamic. It influences some of the core beliefs about ourselves, about the world. And it is that that determines what we think, how we think, and how we live. And so what is influencing our society, what is being poured out into our society? Satan. He is the powerful influence in society against God, and that forms us. That forms you, that forms me, that forms us. 
And the result of this spiritual triad, this evil triad, is spiritual death and alienation from God. But it gets worse. It gets far worse before it gets better. And all throughout this passage, you get the picture of our complete and inability to change our state and to change our fate. He says that because of sin, we are dead. We're dead. Now this may sound morbid, so I apologize. But you notice something about people who have died. They are completely powerless to change the course of their life. And that's Paul's point. We cannot do anything to change our spiritual condition. We cannot do anything because we are dead. We are totally and completely helpless. And thinking that we can do anything to earn our salvation, to think we can do anything to earn a right standing before God is about as logical as expecting somebody who is dead to change their circumstances. As much as we'd want somebody who, who has died to say, enough with you, death. I'll take it from here. That's just not going to happen. It's just not possible. And Paul adds one more detail to the truth about spirituality, that is truly bad news. He says this, Ephesians 2, 3. And we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We live in a world that is bent on and broken by sin. Because our photo album has pictures of our spiritual lives as dead. The end of our spiritual photo album is not looking hopeful. It is looking wrathful. He calls our, spirit, our, our spiritual condition, our, our sinful condition, making us children of wrath. The point is that, that God's wrath is and will be poured out on sin. God's wrath is and will be poured out on sin. In the Bible, God's wrath is described in two primary ways. Present and future. Present and future. In Romans chapter 1, Paul um, describes those who, who suppress, who ignore God's truth, who ignore their knowledge of God so that they can do what they want, how they want, when they want. And God expresses His wrath. He shows His wrath by saying, if this is what you want, then here you go. If this is the decisions that you are going to make, then this then I will honor that. I will give that to you. And it, is, it says that God hands us over to our own desires. And so God's allowance of certain habits, of certain actions, of certain mindsets, is not Him displaying His approval. It is Him expressing His wrath. And sometimes as a parent, this is the, the most loving option that you can do to, commun to communicate to your kids. I mean, you can tell your kids all day long, if you do this, this is going to be the result. If you do this, this is going to happen. Don't do this because, and if it's in their head, and they are set on doing that, there is virtually nothing you can do to stop them. And sometimes some of the most loving things you can do is let them do that in hopes that they would change their mind. And hopes that they would change their ways. And hopes that you would have a little bit more a voice in their life to speak truth into them. And God expresses His wrath presently in that way. But the biblical authors also speak of a future wrath where God will judge all evil and all sin in the world. A day when God will right all wrong and bring to the cosmic, uh, cosmic court all of the sins, all of the law breaking that has been done, that has been broken. And who is it that doesn't like justice? Who is it that doesn't like justice? It's those who have acted unjustly. It is those who have broken the law. And scripture says that all of humanity, all of humanity is guilty of breaking God's law. All of humanity is therefore awaiting judgment, awaiting wrath. This is bad news. This is not good news. Our state and our fate is bleak. It is hopeless. And worst of all, 
we cannot do anything about it. We need spiritual renovation. We need spiritual renovation. And Paul continues in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Here he shifts to talk about not who we were, that was the verses prior, but he begins to shift to talk about who we are because of Christ. He's saying, guys, this, is, this was the truth about your spiritual state. Now here's the truth about your spiritual state because of Christ. Because of Christ, here is who you are. And in this, Paul answers three questions about how we experience spiritual renovation. It's from what, by what, and for what. From what, by what, and for what. But here's the good news. In fact, this is incredible news. When God saw your state, when God saw my state, my fate, He did not look at us and laugh with this vindictive laugh like He won. That wasn't God's heart. God does not look at anybody and wish anybody to experience judgment, wish anybody to experience wrath. That's why He sent His Son to the earth. Jesus was sent to earth to die on the cross for our sin, for our consequences of the law breaking. That Jesus would take the full consequence, the full punishment for our sin so that we would not have to, so that we would not have to experience that. He took our judgment so that we could receive His life. And verse 4 beautifully describes God's motivation. He says that God was so overflowing, He was so rich with mercy, that is, not giving us what we do deserve, but giving us grace, giving us what we don't deserve. And He loved us by the love that He is. Don't miss, don't get hung up on that wrath part as, as many people do, because God is so over the moon in love with you. That he is so eager. He, he is so overcome with the desire to forgive. To show mercy. To restore. That God is, is not this God who is hell bound wanting to send all of these people to hell. God is so over the moon with you that he cannot wait to forgive you. He cannot wait to give a second chance. He cannot wait to restore and to renovate you. That's God's heart. And look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus so that in the coming age, ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What did God save us from? God saved us from our spiritual state and our spiritual fate. That's what God saved us from. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to get Greeky here for just a moment. And then I'll move on. But Paul says that because of sin, we were in the state, the condition of being dead. And the way that this is constructed in the Greek, it gives you the impression that God came to the rescue when we were at the point of being helpless and hopeless and not while we were in the middle of resuscitating ourselves. That it was while we were dead that God showed up, not when we were getting this point of putting our lives together, right? Which is how a lot of people think of it is. That if you just clean up your life, then God will... If you just do this, then God will. And that's how a lot of times we, we see it. But that's not what's being communicated. What's being communicated is while we were dead, while we were um, at this, this point of hopelessness, then God did. But the other amazing thing is how he speaks about salvation. He uses uh, the, the Greek word that he uses here is the Greek word sozo, right? Salvation. And in our passage, and in both times this occurs in chapter 2 of Ephesians, he, he uses the perfect passive, which you're probably thinking, why does that matter? That, that doesn't mean anything to me. Here's the implications of this. 
In the Greek, the perfect tense communicated a past action that was done. And it has ongoing effects. It has ongoing results into the present. So, here's a negative example. Say that you were in a car accident several years ago. Five years ago, you were in a car accident. It was a bad accident. It messed your neck up, your back. But today, five years later, you still feel the effects of that past action. Right? That's kind of the perfect idea that something happened in the past, but it has ongoing results in the present. That our salvation is described like that. That what Jesus accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection from the dead, it happened in the past, but it has an ongoing impact into the future. That Jesus' uh, Jesus' work on the cross was finished. It was accomplished. It wasn't partially done. It was totally done. That Jesus' death on the cross has won a great victory. And it has ongoing impact. It still saves. It still changes. It still transforms us. It still renovates us. And then he uses the passive voice. And the essence of the passive voice is that we're not the ones doing the actions. We're the ones receiving the action. We're the ones who benefit from the action that's done to us. So, to use this example, imagine you're in the car and you get in a car wreck. But you're not the one who crashes into somebody. Somebody who rear-ends you. That's kind of the passive idea. You are receiving that action. And Greek experts call this a divine passive. That the implied person doing the action, doing the saving is God. That God is the one who does the saving. And this is the answer. This is the answer he gives to the second question. By what? By what means are we saved? And Paul's answer is God's grace. We are saved by God's grace. And when you look at this passage, you know that's, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? I mean, dead people don't revive themselves. Likewise, spiritually dead people cannot save themselves and the purpose was that God would communicate and could communicate to us and in the life to come how wealthy, how overflowing God's kindness was toward us. How overflowing His grace was. That through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the only idea that is the biblical idea is the grace-filled idea that God was so overwhelming with His love, with His grace expressed to us through Christ's Death. And just as a corpse cannot do anything to change its fate, so we are completely and totally dependent upon God to be gracious. Upon God to save us. And you know what? He has. He has. And He is eager to save anyone and everyone who would respond to His Son's death, burial, and resurrection from the grave. The bad news is we cannot do anything to change our spiritual state or fate. The good news is that Jesus did it all. That on the cross, Jesus' victory was completed. Next week, we'll talk about that last question. For what? For what purpose are we saved? But let's look at the implications of, that this has on our life. When we read this passage, it's kind of odd, is it not? I mean, why does Paul want us to focus on our past? That's kind of depressing. Why does he want us to, to look at the photographs of who we were? Why does he want us to recall who we once were? Now, here's why. The reason Paul wants us to remember who we were is because it reminds us that we all needed spiritual renovation. Every single one of us. There was not a person in here who came into this world saying, I'm good, I have it together, I'm fine. No, everybody needed this change, this transformation. Everybody needed spiritual renovation. And when we forget that key detail, when we forget that key detail, we live out of alignment even when we are biblically living in line. And when we forget our past of who we were and how God responded to us, three big things can take place. 
The first is that when we forget who we were, we forget who we are. When we forget who we were, we forget who we are. The reason he spends so much time talking about who we were is not because he wants us to live in the past, but because he wants us to remember the implications of what God did for us today. Of how God responded to us then. That because of Jesus' death on the cross, we are now forgiven. Because of that, we are now holy because of what he did. And he wants us to remember that. And when we forget who we were, we mistake God's grace for our work. And this is so easy to do. It's so easy to fall into the mindset that God saved me because I was good enough. Because I did the right thing. Because I had everything together. And the reality is the opposite. The reality is we weren't good enough. The reality is we didn't have it together. The reality is we didn't do enough. We were dead. And there was nothing we could do to undo what has been done. The thing that changes the whole equation is that God showed up and God has been gracious. And the third one, and perhaps I think the most unsettling one, is that we miss the mission. We can miss the mission. And and here's why this is is so unsettling. The first two, if 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 we miss them, we can limp by on that. If we forget who we were, you know, that doesn't impact who we are. And if we mistake God's grace for our work, God is still gracious to forgive But this one has far bigger implications. Because when we forget who we were, we miss the mission. We miss the mission. God's mission is not that we would be these good, comfortable Christians who live in this friendly, safe environment to do church how we like it best. No, the mission of the church is that we would go into all of the world and make disciples of those who don't know Jesus. That's the mission. And when we lose sight of that, of when we lose sight of who we were when God acted toward us, we miss how God still intends to act toward others. And when we forget God's grace toward us while we were spiritually dead, we begin to think that God gives grace towards those who show signs of life. But that's not true. Jesus doesn't raise the half dead. He raises the dead dead. Those who are dead dead. Friends, family, God's strategy, God's heart has not changed. He still loves to pour out His grace toward those who are far from Him, to those who are lost, to those who are spiritually dead, so that they could have a relationship with His Son. Call it whatever we wish. God's mission is always the same, to save the unsaved. Now when we talk about, talk about this in middle America, it's all too easy to assume that because we, we, we live here and there's a lot of Christians around us that we therefore live in a Christian town, in a Christian county and that reaching the lost, reaching out to those who do not have a relationship with Christ is out there somewhere. And then when we begin to think that way, the mission shifts from a rescue operation of the spiritually dead to a safekeeping preservation camp for the spiritually alive. But let me give you a picture that you should add to your spiritual photo album. This is a picture of the religious landscape of our county here. Our county has roughly, give or take, 30,000 people living in it. And of that 30,000 people, over 16,000 people, when asked, what is your religious preference? They marked the box that said, none. I don't have a religious preference. I would wish not to identify myself with any one religion. They would more than likely say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And so often we can get hung up on reaching the found instead of seeking the lost. But God is not calling us to reach the found. He is calling us to reach the lost. That red part on the screen, that is our mission as Christians. That is our mission as a church. And your decision to not forget who you were. That you were, 
in need of spiritual renovation, that you were spiritually dead, has the potential to change and to impact the eternity of those next door to you. It has the potential to change the eternity of the lives of those around us. So let us be a church. Let us be Christians where our wandering grandkids, your wandering neighbors, your wandering co-workers want to come here not because they feel guilty, not because it was this bait and switch kind of thing, not because they felt obligated to, but because they want to, because they found a new chapter in their spiritual photo album because of the decision that you made to not forget who you were. Let us be a church where those who are far from Christ discover God's grace. And as a result, it get to experience the spiritual renovation that God desires to bring to them.